Hi, my name is Alexis Sklarevsky, and welcome to the Slap Bass Program from Video Progressions. Now, on this tape, we're going to work with some fundamental techniques, and later on, turn them into some fairly complex bass parts. Now, I think it's a good idea if you spend a lot of time learning licks off of records or tapes, but a lot of people seem to have a problem because they learn small pieces of ideas, and they can never really seem to put the whole thing together. So what we're going to do here is give you a good, solid foundation, and then you'll be able to take some of those ideas and turn them into creative bass parts of your own. Now, I'm going to be playing a lot of variations, and there's a lot of information, so I really suggest that you take your time and make as many notes as you have to until you get it down really solid. And I guarantee that by the end of the program, you'll have some new ideas, maybe some better ways of looking at old ones, and definitely some good chops. Now, the most important concept that I'd like to talk about in this style of playing is the idea of time feel. Now, playing with good time means that you develop a strong, accurate pulse in your playing. And basically, it means that you don't speed up and you don't slow down. Now, the idea of playing with good feel means that even if you're playing a bass part at a certain tempo, you can interpret it several different ways. For instance, if you're going to play a 16th note groove, it's going to sound like that. Or if you're going to play a shuffle, it's going to sound like a shuffle. Now, one of the most important things I think that you should do is to always practice with a metronome or a drum machine. And I think this is really important because later on when you start playing more syncopated lines, more complex lines, and you start playing with the time, you're not going to get thrown off. You'll be used to using it. Okay, now before we go any further, let's take a minute and get tuned up. So starting on the fourth string or your G string, and the D string, and your A string, and the low E string. Okay, we're going to start this tape off by working on some right hand techniques. And what we're going to do is a series of exercises to develop the slap and pop motion in your right hand. So we're not going to use any notes, and what I'd like you to do is to just wrap your left hand around the neck of the guitar so that all the strings are muted. Okay, now your right hand should be positioned so that your thumb will make contact with the string either right on the neck, right here, or just a little bit in front of the neck so that you get a good solid click coming out. And the pluck is going to be the natural reverse of that, which is to hit down with your thumb and pull out with this finger, with your first finger. So this is going to be the motion for this. Now you should try and use this part of your thumb right in there to make contact with the string. And then when you do your pluck, just on that part of your, your first finger right under there. And try not to get it too far under because otherwise it's going to slow you down. So that's the motion. And now on the A and G string. Nice and solid. Now in doing this exercise, your arm doesn't have to come far off the base. What you really want to, de to develop is a nice wrist snap. So as your forearm is coming down, your wrist is going to snap down onto the string with your thumb. And then the pluck is going to be the release of that. So try and keep the arm motion, the actual arm motion, down to a minimum. Now there's a couple of good exercises that you can do in order to develop this technique. And one is to play octave patterns in your right hand. So we're going to play some and just mute the strings of your bass with your left hand. And now with your right hand, just play the E and the D string and then the A and the G string. So we're just going to play an octave right hand pattern without using any notes, which is basically this. Then moving up and moving back. Now you should try and keep these notes nice and consistent. Keep the time nice and straight so that you can Get, develop some sort of rhythmical motion with your right hand, and it should feel pretty natural. There are several variations that you can do on the thumb and pluck patterns. One is to play a 16th note pattern with thumb, pluck, thumb, and the thumb, pluck, thumb pattern is thumb, pluck, thumb.
then when you just speed it up a little bit. And then again, moving to the A and G strings. Now you'll notice that my thumb is not coming far off the neck, just enough to give it a snap. Try and keep it, try and keep a real strong wrist motion happening and not so much full arm motion. This will give you the most control. So there we have a thumb pluck thumb. Now we'll play a thumb pluck pluck thumb. Now there, I'm coming down with my thumb and then playing a double pluck and then coming back down with my thumb again. Now you should definitely try and alternate these between the E and the D string and the A and the G string so that you get a feeling of motion in your right hand so that you feel like you can switch strings comfortably. The next one I want to talk about is playing straight sixteenth notes. Now we're going to play that and then combine it with some of the other rhythms that I've talked about. So the basic sixteenth note pattern is thumb pluck, thumb pluck. Just that. string and back. Now again, you want to make sure that you can play this very consistently because when you actually start to incorporate some notes into your playing, the right hand rhythm is going to be what determines the sound of the line. So you want to keep this as steady as you can, even if it's at slow tempos. So here's another example of uh, using 60th notes in conjunction with the other rhythms that I've played. Now moving up to the A and G string. So now we'll play example four with the metronome uh, at a medium tempo, and this is what that should sound like. Changing strings. Now I recommend that you play these exercises at different tempos until you really get them down solid. Uh, you should be able to play them fairly fast, so let's try exercise number four a little bit quicker. And remember, try and keep your thumb and your finger just in front of the neck or just on the neck, but definitely in this area somewhere. And remember, you have to make real strong contact with your thumb. Sometimes the thumb has a tendency to slip underneath the string and it sounds sloppy, so you want to make sure that you keep it dead center and the pluck nice and strong, nice and short. Another very useful right hand technique that I've found is to use your thumb and your first finger in a pick motion, which means that you bring your thumb down and you bring your first finger back up, just as if you were holding a guitar pick in your hand and you were playing with a down and up stroke, except you're using your fingers, so you're going to have this kind of a sound. Now this is really useful because say you're playing on the low E string, you can keep a nice steady pedal note going. And this is the 
the sound that you want to have. Now you have to be careful that you get a nice consistency from the downstroke of your thumb to the pluck. You don't want one to be too much louder than the other. And that's, that's the motion right there. Now also you want to be able to use this in playing octaves in order to get your thumb used to crossing the strings over like this. And again, sometimes it's a little bit hard to control, especially on the G string. Sometimes you, you have a tendency to slip off, slip off the string like this. So this is a good exercise in order to really get direct contact with the G string. move up and down the strings and octaves so there you have some basic right hand techniques now I suggest that you practice these exercises until you get them down really solid and as I mentioned before make sure that you use a metronome or a drum machine for everything that you practice I really can't emphasize that enough what we're going to do now is play some octave patterns and bring our left hand into the picture. Now, a lot of funk lines use octave patterns as a basis or a starting off point in order to develop more complex and more elaborate bass lines. Uh, it leaves a lot of room to develop patterns and also to develop a lot of rhythmical ideas. So the first thing I'd like to show you is playing octave patterns with long tones. Now, you'll notice that when I do this, one note is ringing into the other. So what we're going to do is just clean it up a little bit by using some left hand muting. And now you can only hear each note individually. Now you notice that when I play that, that my finger lifts up just enough to deaden the note before the next note's going to be played. So you're going to have a thumb, then a lift, then a pluck, and a lift. So even though you're playing long tones, you're only going to be hearing one of the notes at a time. Just enough to cut it off. So let's try this with the metronome. Now for the short tone exercise, you want to do the same thing, except you want to lift your fingers to deaden the note right away to give you a very short staccato sound. So playing that with the metronome, it should sound like this. Now we're going to play this in combinations of long and short tones. Uh, we'll play a bass line that's just a simple walking pattern in C using C, A, B flat to B and just walking through that. First we'll do it with uh, long tones and then we'll do it using short tones. Now we'll combine these techniques so you can see how they work together. Uh, for the combination, we're going to play a short tone on the bottom and a long tone on the top. So your sound should be like this. The 
top note should ring out longer than the, the one that's on the bottom. Now again, you have to watch your left hand to make sure that you release the bottom note very quickly and then hold your hold your little finger on the leading note up on the top on the G string and let it ring out now we're going to try some variations on this octave pattern uh, we're going to bring the 16th note into the vamp pattern and again using combinations of long and short tones. Now what you really should be aware of in this exercise is how the short tone sets up the next long tone um, in order to make the line feel right. So we're just going to play some simple octave exercises using some of the right hand rhythms that we talked about previously. So the first one is going to sound like this. You have two long tones going into a short tone. And then you're going to play the same walking bass part using the combination of your right hand rhythm and also playing long and short tones, which is mostly a left hand. So now we'll put these two together. Now we'll take it one step further in example six. Using the same bass part, we're going to add some rhythmical motion with our right hand, again using combinations of long and short tones. So example six should sound like this. Okay, so let's try that a little bit faster, and we'll take a look at it from overhead so you can get a different view of what's happening here. Now, example seven is similar to example six. Um, so let's just back up for a minute and we'll mute the strings with our left hand and just concentrate on the right hand part. So uh, just read the rhythmical notation as we did earlier in the tape and we're going to start off with just the right hand rhythm and play along with the metronome. Now listen to what the drums are doing and play the same rhythm again. And this time we'll try it with notes. Alright, now in example 8, we're going to play the first bar of a bass line, and uh, we're going to use short tones and a hammer-on. Now the hammer-on should sound like this.
from B flat to C, just hammer on with your little finger. So here's the line. Keep the notes nice and short. Now in example nine, we're going to use long tones, going to short tones, and also the hammer on. Now in both these examples, you notice that there's some space left between the notes. And this is really an important concept and one that you should be constantly aware of because now we're starting to play with the time a little bit. It's really important to let the line breathe. Now we'll talk more about this later in the tape, but for right now, let's just join exercises eight and nine together and play it along with the drums. Okay, now we'll try that a little bit faster. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about establishing a solid meter or pulse in your mind while you're playing. Now you should be able to feel the relationship between the straight eighth note octave line and the more syncopated bass part like the one that we just played. Now the underlying foundation to that is a steady stream of sixteenth notes. So if you take this tempo and you have you can pick out select sixteenth notes from that. Now, as you can see, you can make the bass line as rhythmically complex as you like as long as you can consistently feel that 16th note pulse underneath it. Now in example 10, we're going to start off with some 8th note octaves using long and short tones and then move into some of the syncopated variations that we've just talked about. So try and feel the relationship between the two. Now you might want to try just singing the straight eighth notes to yourself or playing the octave line while I'm playing the syncopated line. Um, I think this may help you to see where some of these rhythmical variations are coming from. So let me do that again and I'm going to put some more variations in there. Here's the octave. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about playing a standard funk vamp from C to F. And what we're going to do here is incorporate a couple more notes and some more rhythmical variation. So using all long tones, it should sound like this. that when I'm playing that, I'm just walking up from C into the F, and then hitting the 
open A string and then the A octave and walking back up into C. So there's the F, open A, and C. Now let's try this using short tones. In exercise three, we're going to play basically the same line, except now we're going to play some syncopation like we talked about before. Um, now, the one thing that you have to keep in mind when you're playing syncopated lines is to keep them very much in time. This is really important. So now I'm going to play the same notes that we played before, and I'm going to keep the syncopation going in my right hand. Uh, now, in exercise three, we open up with a double shot with my thumb. Like that. Thumb, thumb, pluck. So let's speed that up a little bit, and uh, we'll work on some more syncopated variations. Um, now we'll start with exercise number five, as written, and we'll develop some more ideas as we get into it. Three, four. <laughs> In this next section, I'd like to talk about playing open strings. Now, using open strings is a large part of the slap style, and as you may have noticed, there's a lot of funk tunes that are written in the key of E. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one being that it gives you a physical reference point, and also it provides you with a pedal tone that you can play underneath anything else that you might be playing. Now, there's certainly some problems that come up when you're trying to control the sound of open strings. And a lot of these problems can be overcome by using your right and your left hand techniques in conjunction with one another instead of as independent parts. Now, the left hand technique that we're going to develop is a damping or muting technique. Now, when you want to damp, you bring your thumb down. Now, let it ring through, and then bring your left hand down on the string. And you use your left hand when you want to deaden the note. Now, you, all, you also get a click when you bring your left hand down, which is another idea that we're going to incorporate as a rhythmical effect. Now, you can also create some uh, rhythm by using just your thumb and your left hand on the low E string. And what you're going to do here is hit with your thumb and then bring your left hand down and click, and then bring your thumb back down so you get this. Thumb, click, thumb. Now, 
Now you can also incorporate a pluck into this. And now we're going to play thumb, click, thumb, pluck. Now I'm also using my left hand to mute the high G string as well. So I'm going to bring my thumb down, mute with my left hand, bring my thumb down again, and pluck. Let's take a look at a combination of these exercises from overhead. The extra clicky here is my left hand. In that example, I actually play a note on the top, as you'll see in example six. Now you notice that when you do this, you're going to finger the note on your G string with your first finger, and you're going to use the other three fingers of your left hand to mute the strings. Now you have to lift them off just enough to let this note ring through. I'm just going from E to D. Now there's also some rhythmical variations that you, that you can use. And one of them is to play a double stroke with your thumb. And there I'm hitting the E up top. And also you can move it down to the D. So we'll try some variations with the drums now. Three, four. Now you can also use this coming out of a straight octave line. You're playing the straight octaves and then go straight into the rhythm. Here we'll try a, a hammer-on as well, from C-sharp to D. So we'll try that. Three, four. Now we're going to try playing it uh, with just dead notes sounded, which means that you're going to mute with your left hand and you're going to insert a pluck up top in where the note usually would be. So you want a nice sharp pluck up top. So we'll try that one. Three, four. Now let's try a combination of all of these. Three, four. Now here I'd like to emphasize one of the subtleties of the damping technique. Uh, exercise 13 begins with thumb, click. 
So here the left hand is actually creating a percussive sound when it comes down. Now in the next couple of notes, you're going to play the hammer on from D to E, and then the thumb on the low E string, and here you're just going to lightly damp it. And not actually bring your hand down hard enough so that you create a click. Now, you should be aware of this difference, and it's real subtle, and you do it all with your left hand. So either by coming down hard or else just lightly touching the string, you're going to produce either the click sound or else just dampen the sound. And you'll notice the same thing happens in exercise 14. So here's 13 and 14 together along with the drums. Three, four. Now in example 15, we're going to play some straight octaves in the second bar. Now you want to keep these nice and crisp when you're combining them with the other line. So I'll try that. Three, four. Okay, in exercise 16, we're going to go up the neck, and we'll try this with the metronome. Three, four. Now the syncopation in that second bar is really feel oriented. So rather than just have you read the notes off the page, try and keep the right hand motion going and develop some syncopation of your own. Now I'm going to do it again and just listen to some of the rhythmical variations that you can do. Three, four. The important thing is to keep the bass line flowing and not to make it sound stiff or rigid. Exercise 17. Exercise 18. Now you'll notice in exercise 18 that we're actually going to be playing the G note. Now, it's the G on your D string. Nice and short. Pluck. And here's the hammer on from D to E. So let's try that again. Exercise 19. Now you'll notice in exercise 19 that you're going to play a short note on the G and then come down immediately with your thumb and start your left hand muting. So let's try that one again.
know, you just want to make sure that the low notes are all coming out, the clicks and the tones. Example number 20. Now in example 20, you'll notice how the uh, second half of the line gets much more intense and all I'm doing is I'm simply doubling up on the octaves. So let's try that one again. Okay, I'd like to break away for just a minute and play these same patterns against a shuffle feel. Now, when you're playing a shuffle feel, you're going to be switching from playing 4 16th notes for every beat to playing triplets. So you're going to go from playing 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 3, 4, 4, 2, 3, 4, to playing 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 2, 4, 2, 2. Now, I think this is a good example of how you can change a bass line rhythmically in order to create an entirely new sound. Um, so what we're going to do is play these same patterns and some variations in a shuffle vamp, and then we're going to bring in the lead guitar and finish it up with a heavy rock feel. I'd like to take this left hand damping technique one step further and talk a little bit about another rhythmical variation that you can use. Uh, this is something that I call a machine gun triplet. Now when you do this, the basic motion is thumb, bring your left hand down on the strings, thumb click, and a pluck. Now you notice how the left hand creates a click. Now when it's done quickly, it sounds like this. Now you also have to be very careful not to place your left hand in any area where you might get some overtones or some harmonics. Things like that, unless you want that. But for right now, we want to concentrate on having dead notes. So now if you incorporate this rhythm and put some notes up top,
it creates a little bit of an interesting, uh, an interesting rhythmical sound. Uh, I'm going to play a bass part for you now, and I'm going to incorporate this into a bass line. Now this line is all played in E, and as you can see, I'm just playing a lot of octave patterns, and then into the triplet, and again a hammer on. Let's try it one more time. Now I'd like to show you this technique in a typical funk groove. And uh, in addition to the triplets, listen carefully to the notes that I'm playing. The notes give that familiar funk sound to the line. Now we'll talk more about the notes in a minute, but uh, here's the example as written. So there you have the triplet applied to a funk groove. Now you notice that some of the notes I was using created a very bluesy sound to the line. And I'd like to take a minute to talk about those notes. Now the most common scale used in funk playing is called the blues scale. And the blues scale consists of five basic notes. So in the key of G, for instance, the notes are G, B flat, C, D, F, and G. Now I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this sound. Now, in addition to those five basic notes, you also have several semitones that you can use, such as B flat to B, which is this sound. And also using a D flat to a D. And E to F. And F to G. We'll play these interval exercises now, examples one through four, and uh, it'll help to get the sound in your ear, and also sh to show you how the notes relate to one another within the structure of the blues scale. Exercise one. Exercise two. Three. And 
exercise four. Now you should definitely try and keep these sounds in your ear. Flat three to the major three. Flat five to the five. Six to the seven. And seven to the octave. Because you can use those notes a lot of times as passing notes in a funk line. Now I'm going to take you through some more examples so you can really get the sound in your mind. Now you'll notice one thing about the blues scale, and that is that there's a couple of patterns that work very well as far as hammer-ons, and they, they roll off your hand very easily. Here's the seven to the octave, up to the minor third there, the four to the five, to the seven, You want to always constantly keep those in your mind when, when you're playing them because they should sound very smooth. Just that kind of a sound. And they'll roll off your hand very easily. So uh, we'll do exercise five. Now you'll notice that there I used the four to the five and a double shot with my thumb. Exercise six. Now there, I'm just playing basically the same line again. Again, rolling off with my left hand. Exercise seven. Now here I'm going to incorporate the seven to the root to the minor third up high, which is that sound. And when you're going to play the dead note on the G string, that's what you want to hear, and then a hammer on there. Example eight. And example nine. Now I'd like to play a couple of variations, and uh, I'm going to play along with the drum machine and just play around with the notes in the blues scale.
Now, what I did there was just to expand on some basic ideas and yet keep the general feel happening, uh, staying very much within the boundaries of the blues scale and also the passing tones that we talked about. So I'd like to do this again for you, this time as a bass solo in the context of a tune. And the solo section is in G, so it'll be a lot like the example you just heard. And listen closely to the rhythmical interaction between the bass and the drums, because that's what I'm going to try and emphasize here. Okay, moving on to example 10, um, we have a four bar bass line again in the key of G. So what I'm going to do is play the line as written and then change the phrasing a little bit to create some variations for you. Okay, now you'll notice that when I was playing that, a lot of the interest in the line was created by what my right hand was doing rhythmically. So I think it's important that you try and play with the rhythm and also to make the groove flow. Uh, what I'd like to do right now is to take a minute and talk a little bit about phrasing and leaving space in your playing in order to let the music breathe. 
Um, now you should try and come up with parts that complement the sound as a whole. And sometimes using just a few notes can create a bass line that is really powerful and convincing. And I think by developing this idea, you'll certainly increase your value as a bass player. Now I'd like to demonstrate this for you using example 10 again. Uh, this time we're going to play it as a slow shuffle. And what you should listen for here is the interaction between the people in the band. Now the next example is in the key of E, so we're going to be using the E blues scale, which is E, G, A, B, D, and E. Same intervals and same pattern as before. Now in this example, keeping the same ideas in mind and the same techniques, we're going to be playing in the key of E, so we have an open string. And again, the left hand muting is very important. So here's number 11 with a couple of variations. Three, four. Now, I really took some liberties with the variations on that one. However, everything that I did was within the blues scale. 
And uh, if you go back and listen to it carefully, uh, you'll see that that's all I did. Now the next thing I'd like to do is to play a bass line for you using double stops. And for those of you that don't know what double stops are, just listen carefully and I'll explain it to you in a second. Three, four. Now in this example, what we're playing is the G and the C sharp moving chromatically into the G sharp and the D. Now the G sharp being the third of E and the D being the minor seven. And then we're going to do the same thing down here, except we're just going to invert that interval. So now we have C sharp and G moving to D and G sharp here. So we have this moving to this. And now here we're going to use some notes out of the blues scale again. We're going to have the E on the G string. We're going to play D to C sharp to B. So you're going to have 7, 6, and the fifth right there. So now when you pluck with your right hand, you're going to you have to pluck with your first two fingers simultaneously. So now we'll try this again. Three, four. I'd like to move on now to our last technical section and talk a little bit about some special techniques. Now these aren't necessarily standard techniques, but uh, they are some ideas that you might want to try and play around with and maybe incorporate into some bass lines that you're working on. The first one I'd like to show you is the double pluck. Now for this technique, you're going to come down with your thumb and then pluck with your first and second fingers. Now you'll notice that I'm using my little finger as an anchor against the body of the guitar in order to give myself a little bit more steady hand when I'm plucking. And when you get it up to speed, now I'll play a bass part using that technique. See how my, f my first and second fingers snap off the string one right after the other very quickly. Now the other thing you have to watch is the, is the coordination between your right and left hand. Now the left hand motion is a very feel oriented thing and you're using your left hand to choke the strings. So you have to watch and make sure that your left hand is going to lift off when you want it when you want the notes to sound and also to bring it back down for the clicks that you want to hear there's the motion now you see how my left hand is being used as a mute there and also it lifts off when i want to hear the notes Okay, let's play that along with the drums. Let's take this technique now and put it into another working example. For instance, if you apply it to exercise 13, the double stop exercise, you can do something like this.
Now you notice in this example that I'm playing a double pluck when I move down to the A. Now I'm playing A and G. Here's the G note to F sharp to E. And I'm using my thumb in the open A string every time. Now you don't want to let them ring out quite that long. You want to keep them a little shorter. So it's the same pattern as we were playing off when we were playing up on the E here. 7, 6, 5, and now we're 7, 6, 5, and A. So we'll try it again. 3, 4. Okay, in the next example, I'd like to go one step further and show you the three-finger pluck. Now, in this technique, I find it helpful to bring my thumb down and then change the angle of my right hand a little bit so it's a little bit more perpendicular with the guitar. And also, using my thumb as an anchor here when I go to do the plucks. Now, you see how my hand's just turning slightly here. This is a little bit tricky because most people's third finger is not very strong. And again, you have to pull your fingers out in very rapid succession. So let's try this along with the drums. Now the next technique I'd like to show you is something I call a strum. Now this is a little bit complicated because instead of plucking up, now we're going to use our f all four of our fingers and st strum across the strings downward. You can see that motion as the fingers come down on, onto the strings. And here your left hand is very important to mute because even if you're going to play something simple, your right hand no longer has any control over the strings. You're simply doing this motion with your right hand, and your left hand is going to let the notes ring. And it also works very well on the high strings. Again, it's, it's important to try and make as much contact as you can with each individual finger on your right hand. And there's the motion. Okay, the next technique I'd like to show you is a right hand tapping technique. And here the rhythm is created by using the fingers of your right hand. Now what I'm doing here is I'm bringing down my thumb, my second finger, my first finger, thumb, and third finger again in a circular motion. Now you'll see that each one of my fingers on the right hand is going to strike the E string. That, that's the basic motion right there. And of course, when you get it up to speed, it gets very intense rhythmically. Again, the main thing is to make sure that each finger is going to come into direct contact with the string. So now we'll do it along with the drums. Two, three, four.
this brings us to the end of our tape. Now we've covered a lot of ideas and techniques that should give you some real insight into any bass line that you might hear. And hopefully these techniques will open up new doors for you and you can start to adapt them creatively. Uh, you should listen and imitate as much as you can, but above all, get to the root of what's happening and then elaborate and build your bass lines from there. Now I think you should play with a band as often as possible, especially with a drummer, as I mentioned earlier, because a good bass line is really defined by how well it works against the drums. Um, write and listen as much as you can and think about what you can do to enhance the sound of the rhythm section. And above all, remember, the bottom line is that if it sounds good, it is good. Thank <laughs> you.